Hello. Hey, what up? Well, turns out this is still a podcast. This is happening. We are alive. We we are well. We are secluded. And we are ergo. I'm Kiss. I am Damon. And what we do, pandemic or not, is showcase the folks reshaping the culture of our city and world for the more equitable and creative. How are you doing, Damon? You know, honestly, it's it's like hard to name or say, or you know, you feel you can feel guilt, but I'm doing pretty well uh, on a personal level. Uh, you know, the stillness, um, the, the the new relationship to time, um, and the fact that this is like kind of the way I want to live my life. I've been like practicing isolation for like 10 years, uh, but I just have been struggling because I'm not in flow with the people. And so now everybody else has to sit their ass down too. Uh, And so, you know, before we talk about all of the ramifications and consequences, personally, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, you know, grateful for my living conditions and situations. I'm grateful for my health and, um, the beginning of this time of stillness has been actually really fruitful for me. How you doing? I'm okay. You're not. You're not calling it a uh, quarantine. You're calling it a told you so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this is just the the biggest I'm right ever. <laughs> for uh for posterity's sake, we're recording this on uh, Tuesday, April seventh. So even if it comes out a day or two later, that's when we're recording, and we are you know, deep in the, it's a lockdown, but not a lockdown. It's isolation, but we're not isolated. It's quarantine, but we're not quarantined of like, well, the markets can't close. Um, so we're, I'm in, I'm literally in the, in my clothes closet at home. Damon's in his apartment. The two different sides of the city have literally never felt so far to me. (laughs) You're all the way over there. (laughs) Um, but I'm doing okay. Uh, I've been in my apartment with my boo now. We've been marking the days off on the calendar. So I'm at 26 days since I like really hunkered down. Uh, um, and it's been really wonderful sharing the space with her. Uh, I've been getting that first little claustrophobic feeling of just every time a surface is crowded, I feel like the walls are closing in. Like I have to be keeping <laughs> things super orderly or else it feels like everything's collapsing. Um, but I'm doing okay. And what we're going to be doing today, uh, just to give y'all a little sense of what Ergo is going to look like for the next couple of weeks, Damon and I are just going to check in, talk about what this last couple of weeks has been like for us, and then answer a couple of listener mailbag questions. Um, and then over the next couple of weeks, what we're going to do is some shorter interviews that we're calling On the Line. So these are conversations with folks who are doing on the ground work. Uh, putting themselves on the line uh, in this moment of health and community crisis, um, whether that's in um, organizing work, healthcare work, labor work, uh, kind of across the spectrum, um, getting a sense of what is it like to be doing that work right now, um, and what are the ways that the rest of us listening comfortably to podcasts uh, in our homes might be able to help. Um, So for this one, just Damon and me and a few of y'all's questions. And we might just do other cool shit, too. I, I, I get afraid <laughs> of uh, commitments. So in, ca- in case, just to give us an out of, of if we get to two or three on the lines and it's like, oh, shit, that was hard. <laughs> we might do something else cool. So, you know. That's a great point. <laughs> That's a great point. Um, we might just start uh, live tweeting movies. The, the possibilities are limitless. <laughs> yeah. We're getting ready to either gain or lose some fans. That's that's, <laughs> that's what this is. <laughs> but nothing. <laughs> the rubber beat the road. <laughs> Things will not go back to the way yeah, they were, though. Yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> we know that everywhere, and ergo is no different. <laughs> so so it, it, yeah. So in this couple of weeks, what? Uh, first of all, what's just been your day to day that you want to share, and what's been sticking with you? Um, you know, been going much deeper in my work. You know, I'm, I'm one of those, uh, cliche artistic radicals that's air quote working on a book. And so, you know, you know, <laughs> that like annoying guy, I'm, I'm working on this book. I'm, you know, I got the next episode. So I've been just trying to draft, um, pieces of, of this project. It's not necessarily just a book, but, you know, getting more intentional and in trying to organize this, um, alchemy that has been, my thought practice and my artistry and how they intersect. So 
I've uh, lined out like what I've done over the last two and a half years now. And it's like a, a, a numbered process. And so uh, just feeling all my papers and all my notes being in the places where they need to be, um, you know, getting back. I, I got super out of shape. So I, you know, home gym is kicking my ass more than the, I don't need to be at the gym yet anyway. Uh, so, you know, drinking my smoothies every day. I've, I've read three or four books front to cover. Uh, so, so, you know, that's been, and, and honestly been like organizing more is, is the truth. Like, you know, I, I, I think again, like a collective shock pushes people into, into new behaviors. And so it's been much easier to kind of sit down and stay on task and stay on time, even though like, you know, zoom calls are draining, um, been, been, been doing some good organizing. So yeah, man, it's, it's, it's been really a, a beautiful, fruitful time, you know, digging in the depths of my own psycho emotional <laughs> quips and fuck ups and, you know, get, being deeper and vulnerable in my relationship and in my partnership. And us like, you know, taking the time to stop and ask the real question. So it, it, it's, it's been cool. Uh, I love the way that days flow together. Um, I wish they could do it more. Like, I wish we could, like, get out of hours and days of the week. Um, but yeah, now that, that, that's been my flow. I've been, I've been hunkering down. How about you? I've been doing okay. Um, you know, we're both people who don't, it's not like in pre Corona times, either of us went to an office every day and, and like, I never really understood what people meant by a weekend. Like it never really worked (laughs) for me either. So, you know, I have a practice for working from home and a way of building that discipline and a way of knowing that when I wake up in the morning, I need to plan out what I'm going to do with my day or else it all kind of falls apart for me. So it, I felt I was really grateful to kind of have that preparation, honestly. And, you know, it's very hard to know on what level an emotion is coming through, right? Because we are both lucky enough that right now we are okay, but we're also not okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'll speak for me. Like, in my body and in my home, I'm okay. In my block, I'm kind of okay. Like, I I think, we, you know, I've been thinking a lot about when we did one of those Apple events uh, a couple months ago with Bria, uh, Bria Royal. I don't think you were there for that one, but it was the first one. And, and what we were doing was she had people uh, illustrating an imagined future, right? So the first step for doing that was defining the realm so she's saying both for organizing and for storytelling you have to define what the realm is so like lord of the rings middle earth is the realm for ergo chicago basically is the realm and so for me in this time where i was feeling super panicked i basically defined my house as my realm and i was like this is a space where for the most part i can control what happens in here i can feel safe in this realm it's not out of my control it's not bigger there's no threat inside this building now that's super reductive but it was useful for a while and then shit starts happening in your house that has nothing to do with coronavirus but if you've built that this place is like safe and nothing will go wrong and like (laughs) i had grain moths this week which sounds is like not a big deal but the idea of like oh no there's this infestation and or like we had i had ants like things that just happen in houses sounds like you have weebles (laughs) <laughs> there's a gopher under the lawn but uh all of a sudden i had to kind of challenge that and just like is always the case like nowhere is secure nowhere is protected completely nowhere is completely safe there's it's all about these degrees of risk so that's what i've been trying to think about now is there's nowhere where there is no risk but there are places where there's lesser risk and there are actions you can take that are less risky than others yeah you know in in, in here and you know where you ended off there getting right into one of my comfiest bags <laughs> a bean bag <laughs> uh, yeah 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 i uh I, i'm i'm like i have this like i guess nervousness or anxiety right now like damn i don't want to sound redundant because what i'm feeling right now is just like a heightened concrete real sense of all the shit that i feel like i've been saying for the last five years right it's like uh, uh, abolish prisons or about you know decarcerate like People can understand, like, yes, that that is a crisis, that is uh, an impact on public health, that is, you know, but it is real right now, right? Like, the idea of everyone should have a home and the way that ownership works in land, right? Like, that is real 
right now, the idea that we are never safe, <laughs> right? Like that that is a philosophical or personal psychological state that is not like a, a physical, political, social reality. And that's not to be pessimistic, right? That is to be able to grasp with, with our environment and be able to respond and be able to then, you know, protect ourselves or be able to be creative or be, be collective to, to address, you know, all this shit is just super duper real right now. I think that the thing of talking about realm, uh, that's exciting. And again, I, I'm getting into this too quick. I don't want to really get all into the politics of it. Uh, but just whether it's at a state level, at a grassroots level, at you know movement resistance level, the notion of our existence as global has become the most tangible that it has in at least a century. The head of state of Hungary is responding to the same thing that Donald Trump is, the same thing that's being responded in Bolivia. We can compare and contrast, but then there's also this just like baseline commonality of the same vulnerability, the same risk, um, the same like existential dangers. Um, and then what that means for just us as people is what's happening in India is directly related to our experience. It's not abstract. It's not metaphorical. You don't need sociological studies or anthropology or, you know, history of colonialism or, you know, any of that shit. People, right? Like we are, we are living a common existence. Um, and that's so, so tangible right now. And that comes all the way back into our household. But now our households are not, you know, safe. And not just that, like the experiences are similar and shared. It's like, no, 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 our fates are interwoven. Like, it's not just we have so much in common. It's we are the same thing. We are pieces of one whole. Um, and the choices that someone makes far away, not through the butterfly effect, but like through an airplane <laughs> actually impacts our <laughs> body. Like, effect. it's not as many <laughs> degrees of separation as we think it is. Every once in a while, you know, as people who I think have our ideas and our values pretty clearly defined and are often trying to articulate those values and the worthiness of those values to people who haven't considered them before. It sometimes feels like a gift when the things that we're talking about tell on themselves. Right. Mm -hmm, so like mm -hmm. when, you know, when Trump says a wall works, just ask Israel. It's like, no dude, you're doing our job for us. Um, and <laughs> this the whole governor thing in Texas. Right. And so this whole thing feels like a series of people telling on themselves. Yeah. Or at least not being able to get out of their own way. And it, and it shows like, you know, part of the fear that I think a lot of people feel is the fragility of this. And not just because they're going to lose their investment portfolios, but because their bodies are on the fucking line. Right. There's the fragility of their physical body, our political body, our economic body. And that fragility is real. But it also means that it can be reshaped and, and it's it's more malleable than it is fragile. It's my hope. Yeah. And, and just for like, in case someone listens to this, like not immediately in this time and don't remember what I, I referred to the lieutenant governor in Texas, which is just like supporting a further evidence of what you talk about, of like, you know, the system is telling on itself. Um, th basically, to, to summarize, was saying as an old person myself or as somebody with grandchildren, uh, I believe it is of more value to sacrifice my life for the market to continue on. And that's what we should expect of our elders right now is to make and he said that explicitly yeah like sacrifice your life because the mark the market is greater than you uh and that is what we need and also it cannot it is too vulnerable to stop for one moment right like <laughs> not only is it this you know all powerful all, all valuable thing that we put over life and humanity it also is the most fragile you know high maintenance creation of all time and like two seconds of rest or two seconds of, of of reprieve will destroy life as we know it right and like yeah like, <laughs> like that is what y'all think those are the things that we try to say in protest signs or in angry tweets uh but like through the day-to-day -day rhetoric of the bullshit that like is political theater um you can hide the idea of I believe in profit over people, right? <laughs> but 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 now they, they have to say it. Or, you know, on the other side, you know, the, the, the Democratic Party talking about all treatment for coronavirus should be free. But people who are dying from cancer or diabetes or any other virus, you deserve to die, right? Like just like the, the blatant dissonance of you're saying out loud that health crisis, and we live health crisis every day outside of ones that are so immediately acute. Niggas is dying every day, you know, <laughs> like, like there are, there are, are, are 
epidemics of literal physical health, not just like the metaphorical political things we're talking about. Like people are dying of sickness by the tens of thousands uh, on a recurring, you know, cyclical basis. And that is okay. Like it's not even um, excused or put off to the side. Like that is, that was probably of the establishment of democratic side, right? Like that was probably what the biggest fight was is like more than anything, you know, what the, 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 the platform of the neoliberals or the liberals or the democratic party has been to stop public health care. Um, and so now to see them, have to function in a reality where I, I saw like a, a meme or something like listed the number of people who've lost health coverage due to economic crisis. And it was right. 3.5 million people. And they listed all the countries and all the countries at zero, all 3.5 million people were in America. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not, that's not incidental. That is like what they are the most actively fighting for. Uh, and, and to, yeah, just like to reality, come slap all these contradictions into to like the most basic understanding of life and death is obviously sad because there's so much vulnerability and there there will be so much unnecessary loss. But from the long span of time, like looking at this beyond my own generational existence, um, there is so much opportunity right now to to really really name the world we want because everybody's saying we will never go back to normal. And that only happens once a century, almost, sometimes. Yeah. Before we get to the thing that we're trying to build, uh, the, 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 that next normal, that next future, I want to just go back to something you said about the contradictions. Uh, and yes, we're saying the, like the cultural, national, political contradictions. I'm curious how you've been dealing with personal contradictions in this. Yeah. Which might be easier for you than for me, but like, I have bought way more things online and gotten way more things delivered to my house than I ever have before in my life. I have been less mindful about my spending. I've, you know, relied more on like, uh, you know, comfort food, like all the like, and some of this is like, I create a super strict regimen for myself as a person. And then if I come up short, I teach, I convince myself I've failed and that's not great. And so this, some of this is like trying to give myself permission to let go a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it feels like uh, I'm excusing more of my contradictions because my body's on the, on the line in a way that it isn't usually because of privilege. And so I'm curious for you, how has that been unfolding? Have you been thinking about that in any different ways? Yeah, I mean, you know, always living with like the material, like, you know, none of us should be using Apple products, Nike products, Amazon google you know <laughs> gasoline <laughs> banks <laughs> you know like that that, that i do <laughs> and, you know, the, the, the old classics yeah yeah you know uh uh yeah all of that shit is <laughs> is not in alignment with if we're honestly what we say we want in the world but we're dependent upon it right and so you know i deal with dependency as an issue like central to my life and so i'm always wrestling with that so hmm. uh it it, it it can hurt so the, the the pain can be so prevalent that like I guess I'm I'm kind of I have a comfort in in maneuvering it and and I, maybe even like a a deeper vocabulary. Uh, but the thing for me is more more like social. The contradiction that's coming up is how much I enjoy isolation actually uh, when so much of my life is about pushing the world towards being connected and being collective and sharing and making space together. Um, you know, I, I really enjoy not doing that shit. <laughs> I, I really enjoy being by myself. I really. I think enjoy you just you just gotta anywhere. you gotta pick some different hobbies, Dame. <laughs> Coming out of this, if that's what you take, is yeah, like you know what I this mean, whole getting people together thing. Yeah, yeah. And, it, 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 it's crazy. Like, I, I, yeah. So, so that's one. Um, and then kind of similar to that, you know, I think I push for and, and perform and, and sincerely offer and express like a deep love. And like empathy and like supportiveness, but then also seeing like how emotionally withdrawn I can be, or or, or how I can um what's not the word not denial, but like when you put something off or or like compartmentalize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the the so so my grandmother was ill, right? And so and then facing with her vulnerability, and she's she's back home and she's better now. But just knowing how deeply I I I value family and connection and love and ancestry, but how in my body, my response system is to withdraw and go within. Um, and I feel very guilty about that because I, 
I've gotten comfortable with understanding that that's like what's what I need and what I'm what I'm comfortable. But am I depriving or am I being irresponsible? Or am I um, being insufficient in like my human duty uh, to my loved ones? Because my response when things that are, are heavy or sad um, or difficult, if I'm not like directly called upon to facilitate and respond, um, is is to to retreat or withdraw, um, and that is not what I think. I'm saying the world should be. <laughs> and so, yeah, feeling those two things, like being, being the, the, the organizer or the, the people connector that don't want to deal with people that wants to like just, you know, write, read, smoke, do some pushups, you know, <laughs> um, and then being an emotional facilitator, a, 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 a caregiver, a, you know, someone who's been named as a healer, and I can always show up when called upon, but when not directly called upon, but it's just kind of like my cosmic duty. Uh, my instinct is 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 retreat as opposed to to stepping up, and so uh, I, that that's like embarrassing or, or or just troubling, I should say. Yeah. Have you been pushing back on that, or is it just like a contradiction right now with the family stuff? You know, in in small ways, yeah. But you know, I I still feel pretty much, and and, and it expands beyond family. People without income, people without sustainable housing, people without sustainable access to food. I'm aware at large and have direct connection or direct understanding of who some of those people and like, should I be out all the time? And, and, but that's also one of the wrinkles of this moment is what the response should be is almost the unhealthiest thing to do. If I don't have to physically put my body on the line, if that's not what it's called for, sending the text, sending the call, being on the Zoom chat, being all in the group thread. Uh, that's not my mode. That's, 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 uh, can be very foreign and, uh, disembodying for me. That's outside of me. Um, and it's, it, I've become much harder performing in that sense of like being inauthentic is the older I get is getting really harder. Uh, and I was really good at it, uh, for a while, hmm. but it, it's almost like, um, debilitating. Can you, what, I don't I don't understand what you mean. What can you and as much as, you know, we're going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I'm not just talking about just like in my family. So, I can, you know, it's, it's an at-large thing. But what I value or what I know is a type of love and empathy and responsiveness. And I also have deep experience in being all of those things. But many times that's not my honest, authentic space when it feels like it would be appropriate, right? So at a time where, oh, man, you should be, you know, hitting everybody up saying, I ain't doing check, like, Doing that when I don't feel like doing it, not in the sense of like the labor, but like the actual performance of giving people what they need, which is beyond what I'm trying to do, is becoming harder unless it's like in the st- on the stage, like the proverbial or like literal stage. Yeah, I don't think you got to do that shit. I'm not. <laughs> 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 I'm just aware of the impact of it. <laughs> but yeah, I don't think you, I don't think you got to do nothing. Yeah, no, and that's and, and today was the first day that I woke up not feeling delinquent or behind. Mm. This is maybe an uncouth metaphor. Well, I'll, I'll make it this way. It's a little like detoxing, right? Yeah. You know, it takes so long for this shit to get out of your system. And there's still lasting impacts of it. There were going to be different chapters of what this time feels like for each of us and like culturally what the impact of this is going to be. Um but, you know, right now we're, for most people, two to three weeks into this, if they're doing anything at all. And uh, it's a real head scrambler. Yeah. Of, you know, all the things that we do that tell us who we are, we're not doing, but we're still here. And we shouldn't be doing that shit. So that's one, that's the, like, existential concern. I always feel guilty talking about, like, the challenges of just being in my house because there are so many people who that's not what's happening right now. That's just my like little half virtue signal, half just guilt. Like that's where when I talk about that contradiction, I feel it most is like my body is not any more valuable than the body of the person who's putting it on the line to provide the service for me. And I don't know what to do with that. Right. You know, it just is what is happening. Like I can't control, I can make some choices within it, but I don't believe my body's more valuable, but the logics of these structures have always said and are continuing to say that my body is more valuable. And it is harder to challenge that right now because if I do, 
you know, everyone has to put something on the line. But this is like a pretty clear one to one. Like, don't be a fucking hero right now. But no one should have to be a hero right now. Don't be a hero. Don't be an asshole. <laughs> Get some good words to live by. <laughs> Um, so the only thing that I've come up with to kind of like challenge that, you know, I'm not a person with a lot of use for that guilt anyway, and I don't think it's useful is if you're someone, and this is what I'm going to continue to do and try to do more of who in this time has not lost their access to capital, to work, to money coming in and has that stability, just earmark like a substantial portion of that money that's coming in beyond what you need to survive. And even if it's just for three months. Like, don't think of that money as yours. Mm. That money can just be on a cycle redistributed to the people who need it right most right now. Yeah. Because so many, you know, we have 6 million people who filed for unemployment last week in this country, which is bonkers. And then there's all the people who that doesn't even fall with and things that haven't happened yet. So what I'm thinking, you know, obviously we can't take care of everyone, but as someone whose work isn't contingent on going out of the house right now, I'm just earmarking a portion of my of the money that comes in during this time and saying that money isn't mine and I'm going to figure out where it goes that's but powerful. I don't own that money that money doesn't belong to me. So that's that's the way I'm uh I'm carbon offsetting my my societal guilt. And I, and I guess my my concluding thought that's really is like listen to our bodies right now to that idea mm. you said of detoxing cuz just to clarify like the point I'm at now is like I fought because I was able to have more time and space to understand what my processes truly are, the types of things that are like really weighing on me or really a struggle. Um, for example, like drafting an essay or a statement to respond to the time and like all of my anxieties about writing and blah, blah, blah. Um, and sharing that with like a, a, a group process was able to get that done. And I just realized the seven to 10 day cycle of what the process was um and then was able to struggle through it like you know work through the fear and be transparent and vulnerable about it and it was like the first time i didn't just say i give up in the in the way or or this isn't good enough or do it and then not share it like hey i got it and kind of like hide about it um and like after i got that out didn't realize how you know how much it had been weighing on me and how i always have little tasks like that weighing on me um and so taking the time to be able to actually function fully through my processes and understand and, and hear my body more uh allow me to be more effective and then this idea of listening to the body is just also teaching me and i keep asking like why are we doing all of this shit i don't know like how many times you've had to go outside but like it is exhausting it's like doing one thing i i, I had to, it was like my mom's birthday we like drove by we didn't even have a party i was out for like two hours and i came home and i was i was swamped uh and and swamp that's i don't talk like that <laughs> i came home and i was tired to say <laughs> swamped <laughs> swamped Just, have you tried to walk through a swamp that shit is exhausting <laughs> but quicksand then, yeah. gators <laughs> the whole issue but, but doing one just literally going outside at all because i've been able to like detox out of this constant run around and not realizing that, hey, I committed to four things today. I'm in four different parts of the city within 24 hours. Or, oh, over this course of 10 days, I've done 25 appointments, right? <laughs> like we, things that you just like chalk up as normal or don't count. Like, oh, I just drove here. Oh, I just did labor. Oh, I just traveled. Once you stop doing that, you realize that like the human body, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. We're not supposed to be running around like this. We're not supposed to be moving. That is a part of why so our, some of our immune systems, immune systems are deficient. Um, we're supposed to be resting. We're supposed to be, you know, close to our domicile. We're supposed to be able to go within walking distance and get where we need. Um, we should not be ripping and running uh, the way that we do, particularly for things that are not necessities, right? Like, like fuck you. I, I don't know whose job I want to diss right now, but like, Fuck your ad campaign. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like whatever, whatever it is that you're so busy about. You know, all all of this like this toll that we put on our on ourselves is not right. And I think now we can like hear. It's almost like when you stop going to the gym and try to go back. It's like that's crazy. I used to do all that, but like the opposite, right? Like we should feel sore by being forced to labor the way that we do. Uh, yeah. 
because the muscles haven't been built up. Yeah. 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 We should be allowed to rest. Rest should be compensated and provided, right? Like that is a necessity for our health is to rest at least a third of the day. Right. And, and so that's like the thing that I, before we get into the questions that like, I really want all the systems of like housing, food, medicine, like we can start to figure that out, but just like the human body is supposed to be still. I think I figured out how long people are supposed to stay in quarantine based off what you said. The amount of time you stay in quarantine should be equal to half the amount of time that you've spent sitting in traffic at the interchange. <laughs> right. Like if you add up all the time in your life that you've been sitting at the, at the interchange in traffic, mad as hell, ha- divide that by two. That's how long you should stay in the goddamn house. <laughs> I'm not a doctor, <laughs> but that is my suggestion. All right, let's, a- let's answer some questions. All right. Yeah, man, I'm the mailman. Can't you tell, man? Gonna post it. So the first one comes from friend of the show, someone who I late in life found out uh, is apparently a custom sartorialist, which I didn't know, but I knew him as a labor organizer uh, and just a hell of a guy. Uh, this is from Emmanuel. He asked us when we're going to finally interview G Herbo. Obviously, that's not a question that's up to us, but I think we could use it as a jump off point for like, because he's on my like list of dream guests. Mm-hmm. Uh, who are the five like dream guests you have for the show? Right, right, right. Yeah, shout out Herbo. Yeah, th- th- I haven't listened to it in depth, uh, but I've heard him speak about it and I've seen young people's reaction to it. The PTSD project out right now, particularly for, and it's uncomfortable naming this, but it is my experience, like the black male young boy experience in Chicago, like what it was as a piece of healing art. Uh, and this is even before like going deep into it uh, is amazing. So shout out to like what's happening right now. Um, and and a co- there's like a collective dealing with trauma that I've never seen in that type of language before. So fucking with him. Met her on my birthday a few years ago at the iFest, then met his cousin, who's his DJ, and then hung out with him again a couple years later. He kind of, like, remembered me or at least gave me the, like, the, cl- the clout send-off or pretending like he remembered me. So I know his cousin is what people say in Chicago, so maybe we might get, get her. But my list, all right, I'm talking too much. Um, I'll settle for a clout send-off. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, top of the list is probably ta Coates. Um, right up there with him is uh, Ruthie Wilson-Gilmore greatest abolitionist thinkers in the world right now uh you know black woman is black feminist tradition from the critical resistance body and you know so much work afterwards um so you should just anybody who is not familiar with ruth wilson gilmore should just like consume every piece of content every word she's ever spoke or written and you'll understand the world better um all right that's my first two i'm gonna take a second and pass back to you and think of my other three i'll give two no Name oh, yeah. and Hannibal Burris are my two. I just feel like Hannibal, there's this whole other, as a longtime Hannibal Burris fan, there's this whole other side to his life that is like not private, but isn't him being a comedian and in movies where he's just like <laughs> doing interesting shit and like yeah. has an organization out West and like donated, you know, did a fundraiser show for BYP 100 in the midst of the Laquan shit. Like just like all these yeah. pieces where I'm like, this guy is paying attention and thinking about it. Uh, and I just would be super interested to get in a different bag than he's ever asked about. And I think that we could hang with him in terms of like keeping it light and keeping it engaging. So that, that, and then of course, just no name who's my favorite writer ever or favorite, uh, rapper probably ever. Right off the no name, uh, there, there, there feel, there's a hole in my heart or I think a hole in our archive that we don't have Mick. So Mick Jenkins, um, mm-hmm just how important he was in terms of, you know, our local ecosystem. It's funny. I feel like I had so many people when we started the show and some of whom we haven't had on, right. but they don't feel like they're on my list anymore. It's yeah. just shifted. Um, you want to talk about that? You want to throw that in there? What we think about it, is that uncomfortable? No, sure. I just don't. So one, just like the cool kids aren't as cool anymore. Yeah. And two, I stopped paying attention to who was cool as much. So there's like a whole bunch of people, like, you know, we've talked about it on the show before, but there were like rooms that I wanted to be in that brought me to the city. And there were a lot of people in those rooms who, even if they weren't at the center of it, they were definitely part of it. And I was like, I really want to be connected to this person. 
and I just don't anymore. And some of that's <laughs> yeah. about me and some of that's about them. But it feels like there's somebody I'm missing. I'm trying to think like large scale. You know, this is not a living person. The only thing that I've been reading in quarantine is this book about um, about Harold Washington. Uh, yeah. And I just think that would be so fucking fascinating. It would. That don't count. I'm not letting you add that to the list, but that's that's a good answer. All right, I got one for you while, while you're thinking. This is my fourth. Uh, Robin Kelly. Okay. Amazing writer. Yeah, I mean, yours are, yours are somewhat doable, no? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yours are too, right? What'd you say? We could, Hannibal is possible. Yeah. All right, I got a wild card. I'm, 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 all right, this is my fifth. So, so who did I start with? I started with Tana Hasi Coates, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Mick, Robin Kelly. I just got self conscious of not having enough women in my list. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's funny. I could I could see it in your eyes. That was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Lakeith Stanfield. Ooh, yeah, yeah. I'll put Donald on mine. Okay. I would love to interview Donald Glover. That would be so interesting. Yeah. Why Lakeith? Uh, just to see, man, just to see if he's as interested as he pulls off. Like he's pulled off <laughs> some of the most interesting performances and characters, and uh, I, I project those characters' depth onto his person. And just the way you know things I hear him say, the way I hear him respond to things, his yeah. social media presence, similar to to, Han- to Hannibal, of like being accessible, being a real person. Um, but being engaged and in tune and thoughtful um, in a way that is related to their public position, uh, but but separate and distinct and and, and authentic uh, in a way. So yeah, he's just kind of like if I could be as cool as him, type of thing. I feel like I would be out here. I can't believe you didn't say Kendrick Lamar. You're right. I take Lakeith Stanfield off my list. I guess <laughs> I just don't like treat him as a human being, and I just want right. to like know him and be in the room. <laughs> and, and he, you know, his, his, I've seen his interviews and that's not the strength. You know, I would love to talk to him more about, pro- I would love to talk to him. It's it's a little bit like when we, when we interview producers or visual artists and it's yeah, like, oh, yeah. this is, talking isn't your medium <laughs> in this way. Yeah. yeah. But you're right. You're right. Kendrick is my, like Kendrick and ta Coates are like my two, you know, yeah. guys. All right. I think I just need one more. There are people I want to talk to, but not for this show. Like I'm right. thinking about like, what's a great Ergo episode? I feel like Boots Riley would be a perfect Ergo episode. I was thinking that when I said Lakeith. Just because he's got all the, you know, the artistic, the musical, the labor, or the hardcore organizing. the Barbara you know, Ramsey used to, used to babysit Boots. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you think she can, like, scold him into coming on the show? That would be good. Potentially. Potentially. Or she could, she could sl- slide ass over. Yeah. No, his dad is a real old school radical, like, for real, for real. So that seems like a pretty good list. We've also apparently just run out of Chicago people that we are dying to talk to. That's a, at least half not Chicago. Well, that feels un- un- unattainable. Un- yeah. Uh, yeah, of, yeah. Of, you know, there's still plenty of people that, that we have that, that I want to bring on that that just aren't dream list. That's just the list. <laughs> <laughs> All right, second question. Send that shit like mailman's, mailman's. And this comes from Ariana Eggleston, who does our Go Back Illustrations. Ah, um, shout out. Ariana asks, has there been a discussion of curl care slash routine slash journey slash et cetera on the show? Would love to hear it. Ah, the routine. If you look at our studio photos, the, the great subplot of Ergo is our personal hair journeys, I suppose. Never said that about myself before. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I, my, my, my feels anticlimactic. People ask me this all the time. I wash and use conditioners. I don't have like any type of <laughs> distinct brand that I'm loyal to. Usually things that have words like shea or coconut or cocoa or butter. Or <laughs> Had you stopped cutting your hair when we started the show? Yep. I got my last haircut like ten, within five to ten days of going to Ferguson for the first time. So that was already a year. Yeah, just about. Wow. So for those listening, that's the, the trajectory is that Damon has not had a haircut since, which, yeah. as we were talking about beforehand, has really made your life much simpler in this era. I've been ready to get off this system. Stop going to the barbershop, <laughs> spending 40 to $80 a month and three to five hours of your life. Just ready to survive <laughs> on what I need, man. Just try to, try to be my natural, beautiful self. So yeah, you know, got to shout out uh, the partner, Jennifer, because... 
probably would have been looking a mess or cut it off by now or just had like free form locks because uh, it got to a point where like consistent maintenance would not have been possible without twisting it and braiding it. And so once that got brought into the play, learning how to protect it in a way that I like anyway and is like a little bit more flexible and durable for life, get, getting my hair braided and twisted is really, really the the magic and truth to my journey. And then doing almost nothing after that. Got it Jennifer. <laughs> yep just continuing to be a good loving partner that's your hair Always. routine yep <laughs> don't be an asshole is the again the theme of the show <laughs> <laughs> um so my maintenance is trash that i don't do enough uh i did recently switch shampoos but i did stop cutting you know my curls have gotten longer than they are right now um but i did stop cutting it probably a year and a half two years into the show on any regular basis and just let the top go and it was a um conscious choice around like you know i'm someone who passes as christian basically like i'm not like a traditionally jewish looking person uh in every way sometimes i you know depends on the angle but um (laughs) my hair curls and that felt like a way of connecting uh and also like i think it was kind of post post trump of like i'm not gonna it it was a small act of non-conformist rebellion basically of like I don't want to blend in right now. I want to look different and I want the way I look different to be something that's connected to not this imagined past of nostalgia of you know make America great again, but like actually like where, you know, hair roots, like where where I actually come from and and, and you know the things that I carry with me every day um that have been, you know, passed down to me. So yeah. that that's that's my little piece on it. Yeah, no, I can add greater significance. I was being flippant, because uh, like to the point of it's not a coincidence that in you know going to Ferguson was the last time I cut my hair. I had been aware of you know within my my position within Black masculinity uh, the significance of hair in relationship to respectability politics um, and somebody who has been some ways pushed towards, some ways coerced into, some ways like evaluated and um, confined by these notions of like black excellence and elitism that are needed as survivors or as modes of resistance or that our community will not be able to repair or heal the the damage and the dysfunction that we experience if we don't have this elite class of representatives uh, who are able to like function and maneuver within powerful and privileged institutions. Um, and a big, big part of that from like, you know, from about like the time you start kindergarten, four to five is like this idea, especially in the like the 90s, 2000s, where there was this like real uniformity uh, to, to like the black hair cut. Uh, it was kind of just one haircut <laughs> that we all were doing. It was a very simple board in the barbershop, just like yeah, one yeah, picture yeah. of one person. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous that it was so many different n- numbers and different angles of that same damn haircut <laughs> for 15 years. Uh, and, 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 you know, you know, our, our mothers, our, our, our school administrators, you know, will point out that, if you know, within seven to 10 days of your natural hair texture growing in, you look messy, you look unkept, you look like a bum. You knock like I remember being eight and nine being told like if I grow my hair I'm not gonna be able to get a job and it's like I'm not in the labor market like I'm not looking for a job right now like why why is this being confined you know like it would be illegal to give you a job right now yeah you know they definitely had like some personal trauma in like the household around like wanting to grow my hair and wanting to have braids and wanting to look like little Bow Wow and Allen Iverson Um, and the idea that like that is a danger for me or that is beneath us or I need to be um, taught or scolded or disciplined into like not valuing uh my own self right um and how that is directly connected to white supremacy so it's interesting it wasn't until i started learning and question patriarchy because for black women we're able to critique or have this conversation of oh you don't love yourself oh you're trying to change the way you look oh you have these eurocentric beauty standards uh, but then i started to recognize that there's not much distance from you know changing your texture through extensions or through, you know, different clothing or, or, or other types of hair, um, then cutting it off so that the natural texture of the curl does not appear or keeping a perfectly razor straight, you know, military lining around my, my boxed head. Um, like it's literally boxing me in. Uh, and I was aware of it and I was fearful uh, that I couldn't go through the transition stage of getting past it. 
Um, it was like, oh, I might still need to access these things. I don't really have a life plan. I don't know what I'm about to do. Uh, but it wasn't until interim rebellion, and interim movement, that I was like, okay, I know I'm not trying to go get no job no time soon. I'm not trying to conform to, to you know, the capitalist market. Um, that's not even on my radar. I'm out here. Uh, I'm finding myself also as an artist uh, and, you know, was able to, you know, with intention, go beyond the basics of like having to fit the norm. And so it's really, really has been a point of, and not only like politically, but then also socially, like uh, the fear of like, I won't be desirable. I'm not attractive, right? Like you told your whole life that you're ugly when your natural hair grows in, when your lining gets messed up, when your facial hair starts to grow in. Um, and so, you know, that's another shout out to like my partnership of like being affirmed, being comforted, being still seen as like lovable and beautiful and, you know, a desire and a, an appreciation of my hair and growth. And so also, I don't think without, it was movement, but also a relationship of like, oh, I'm not out here in these streets trying to, you know, get chose anyway. Uh, so I don't need to be looking at this artifact. Cause that's all I was doing anyway. I was trying to be cute. And, you know, I was a little lonely horn dog who's, <laughs> who's trying to get some action out here. And so I would wear Just a, a well manicured horn dog. Yeah. Just, you know, I would wear drugs and, and get away. So, so people would think I'm fine. And yeah, that shit is is as like placid as the other like more political structures and norms that that we're fighting against. So so you know, I was I was being silly at first, but it is like a deep deep part of like identity and growth and coming into this like new position in the world. And so now my hair is as long as our my organization, Let Us Breathe Collective, my relationship and movement, and just about as long as my actual relationship to my partner too. So it's very symbolic for me. If there's one thing that I think. I want to impart to our listeners. It's be just as hairy as you would like to be. <laughs> like if you want to be really hairy, be really hairy. If you don't, don't. But don't let anyone tell you how hairy. I think you're preaching to the to the choir a little bit. I think our listeners. I think they they got you beat on it's that. It's a hairy crew. Hairy listeners. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't worry, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> the exact level of body hair that I was hoping for. This is, this is what I've been. This is what I've been working for. <laughs> All right, before we get out of here, last question. Pull up on a nigga block in a mail truck, mail bag hanging with the Nina in it, well tucked. Tuck. And this one comes from uh from Evan, who's a Shout listener in Milwaukee, Evan. who we met at our live show, uh, Unelectable, a couple weeks ago. Evan asks. In this moment that is simultaneously a giant confirmation, is basically what we've been talking about. In yeah. this moment that is simultaneously a giant confirmation that the structures that are supposed to support us do not, and that there's potential for a better world, and that many of us are living within several steps into that world, both now and in the future after the virus passes, what structures and systems are you willing to divest from in a new way, and what are you willing to invest in now in a new way? Yeah, I'll give it a first shot. Um, and thanks, Evan, for that very thoughtful question. Um, it's almost difficult to answer because, you know, like I kind of started off with, like, I've been thinking very explicitly for this type of moment um, of people being ready to change and transform the world and create new structures. Um, so I want to offer something new. I think the in the new way is the most important part of the question. But I, I think that I think things are just more real and immediate, right? Like the idea of evictions and foreclosures being canceled is, is then a new way to talk about the fact that capital ownership of people's home and shelter is as problematic as capitalist ownership of people's medical systems or capitalist ownerships of people's food systems, right? The idea of, hey, we need to have some class solidarity around the fact that there is many of us that if someone else decides can take the steps to displace us. Um, and I think it has been seen as a black problem. It has been seen as a, a brown and indigenous problem. Um, it has been seen as a poor problem. Uh, but there are people that have, at many different income levels that have a, you know, a landlord, which is like the most futile shit ever. Um, and the idea that the state is subsidizing that. So we, we, there's this mythology of this like free market or these like individual, you know, pioneers who are out here just like making really great decisions and know that's why they own your house. But it's usually, you know, some type of like company or some type of corporate body or some type of thing that has a relationship with the state getting subsidized um, and receiving collective funds to be able to own 
houses in mass. Um, and it's not a person or a human relationship. It's about profit. Um, and so in the same way, obviously, police and prisons are like the entry point of like a political platform for me. And I don't believe that those things should exist. Um, and so demanding decarceration, as Angela Davis said, uh, Iran decarcerated like a third of its prison population. So that means to scale the U.S., uh, should be decarcerated around 700,000 people or so. Uh, and so, like, the new way is, hey, it is happening in real time. This is not an idealistic or abstract demand. Do that shit. But then going past that of realizing not only should no one be in a cage and no one should be tortured, everyone should have a home, uh, and that our system should guarantee that uh, regardless of what markets or, or profit-driven relationships say. So that's structurally, is there anything just like personally in your, I mean, you're, you're a divested ass motherfucker already, yeah, but yeah. is there anything already that you're like, you know what, even if there's something that right now you're still putting your money toward uh, or your energy or your value toward, is there something that like when, when you can go outside of the house safely, you're more willing to, to let fall away? Probably one of the things I'm the worst on and I don't even use it that often, uh, but just like my internal relationship to Amazon. I make way more space for it than I should. And I don't even buy like day-to-day shit. It's really, I just really love the way the books are organized. Uh, and so creating that list and like, you know, just that, that database. And, and so as a book shopper, uh, I know that, that that's problematic and I need to get out of that. And so the fact that it's not working no more uh, m- makes it easier towards imagining taking that the very simple energy of figuring out new ways to, to, to shop for the books I want digitally. It's nice when people render themselves obsolete. Yeah. <laughs> Mine is, as always, food related. It's become so much more present on everybody's mind, like trying to understand supply chain a little bit better. And like, where is this coming from? Who are the people touching this? So that's been just beautiful to watch is like people who have been able to condition themselves to invisibilize that labor mm-hmm. from the field to their plate have to because now their fate is even more directly interwoven have a better understanding of that or i think more people but you know the only place where i've really felt safe shopping relatively has been this food co-op near my house and the reason why i have is because the people who are shopping there are the ones who are the owners right so they're taking care of themselves and each other because they're the owner like it's the same it's like we are going to account for people's lives and safeties and livelihoods more because, because we are the people <laughs> it's ours um and so you know i already i work the farmers market i get a lot of my food directly from farmers but like moving out of the supermarket model and which has never been safe or sustainable but really right now it doesn't feel safe or sustainable yeah. um and like there's a way that isn't just invisibilizing another link in the chain right it doesn't mean just get instacart it, and and separate yourself in the labor anymore it's buy in and participate um so that for me is where like i'm gonna actually double down and put my 10 bucks a month and become a co-op member hey um, shout you out and uh and turn to them for for my food so that that's the one for me i'm willing to divest my participation in uh both supermarkets but and then also realizing with all these restaurants shutting down you know, we think about supermarkets, but so much of our supply chain, food-wise, and low-quality supply chain goes to restaurants. Even nice restaurants, fancy restaurants. People think if you go to an expensive restaurant that the food is necessarily better quality. It isn't. Uh, it might be the preparation is more advanced, or they're just upselling you. But, you know, the the quality of what we're putting into our bodies right now, preparing our own food on a much larger scale, is much higher than it was when people were just buying food to go. Uh, and I know not everyone is able to do that right now. Both people are working and they don't have the money to be buying high quality groceries. But not having that other option, you know, you would never cook food for yourself the way that people prepare food for you in a restaurant. Um, and so for me, that's mine. Um, I feel sufficiently checked in. Do you feel you feel checked in? I do feel checked and I do feel in. It is very warm in my closet right now. I'm going to go out and get some yeah, air. I'm hot too. <laughs> we're about we're gonna record uh our next episode right after this um and you'll hear it in the next couple of days but you know as always we're thinking about you out there and you know hoping that you're safe and able to take care of yourselves and the people that you love 
Um, and Damon, you know, I just have been thinking about you and Jennifer a lot. Not that I, not that I'm not often thinking about you too, but, um, you know, especially with Rosie here, we've just been, the ways that our lives inter are still intertwined, uh, even when we're not seeing each other is really lovely for me. And, um, I'm glad to continue getting to do this, but also just thinking about like, and being grateful for, you know, the love we have for each other and the people in our lives who we love being okay. So yeah, man. you're my boy. I appreciate you. Right back at you. And listeners, we'll be back uh, with our next episode, showcasing the folks reshaping the culture of our city and world for the more equitable and creative. Much love to the people. Peace. Rosie. Daniel. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Look who's here in the studio. It's me. How's it feel to be in here? Well, I was a little nervous uh -huh. earlier, but mm -hmm. now I'm a little more calm. Wonderful. And I'm staring directly <laughs> into your eyes. But we do that all the time anyway. Yeah, but there's not always all this equipment in between us. Well, maybe this will help. Let's play a game. Okay. So I'm thinking maybe like uh, taboo. Taboo. Like I'll give you some clues and then you'll have to guess what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Does I that know, make sense? I know how to play taboo, Daniel. Oh, you'd prefer if I did not taboo explain? Yes, please. All right, let's get started. Timer on the clock. Ooh. All right, first up. Okay. It's an independent podcast app. Got it. It embraces the open world of podcasting instead of locking it down. Mm -hmm. It has no exclusives. Mm -hmm. No premium content. All right. No paywalls. Great. And it's a great podcast app for everyone. Mm -hmm. Do you think you know it? I think I do. Huh. What do you think it is? Sounds like the Overcast app. Beep, 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 beep. Toots got it. Yay. Look at that. I win. Nicely done. How does one get the app? Well, if one were to want to get the app, one could get it for free in the App Store. Fantastic. Cool. You're going to check it out? I might. Very wonderfully non-committal. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's get out of here. Bye.